Welcome to Pediatric Podcast for PedsCases.com. Hello, everyone. My name is Nathan Gollner, and I'm a medical student at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. This podcast was developed in conjunction with Dr. Karen Forbes, a pediatrician and medical educator at the University of Alberta. This podcast and an accompanying instructional video is the second of a two-part series intended to introduce you to peripheral intravenous insertion in the pediatric patient. Part one emphasized a pre-procedural approach, and in today's session, we'll outline how to establish a peripheral IV in a child. By the end of this podcast and instructional video, the listener will be able to list common indications, contraindications, and complications of PIV placement, list the materials necessary for peripheral IV insertion, and list the procedural steps of peripheral IV establishment. Let's start with a clinical case. You are working as a medical student in the emergency department on New Year's Eve. This is a busy night and the staff is swamped. You have been asked to place a peripheral IV in a six-year-old patient named Danny who presented clinically dehydrated with a two-day history of anorexia and vomiting. Reading his chart, you learn that he has been in the emergency department for about 45 minutes and had Emla cream applied by the triage nurse. You walk into Danny's room to introduce yourself to him and his parents. Danny is laying on the stretcher looking tired with deep respirations, dry mucous membranes, and the monitors show some tachycardia. Does this patient need to have a peripheral IV established? Let's start by looking at the indications, contraindications, and complications of peripheral IV placement. Indications. Intravenous access is typically obtained in situations that require rapid provision of therapy or in those where therapy cannot be administered as effectively via other routes. Examples include hydrating a dehydrated patient with severe vomiting who is unable to tolerate oral intake, providing IV medications. These may include resuscitation medications in patients who are acutely ill, antibiotics, pain medications, and others. Providing blood products, preoperatively to allow for administration of anesthetic agents. A peripheral IV may also be established as a precautionary measure in a patient whose health is at risk of deteriorating. Next, let's talk about contraindications. In general terms, if therapy can be given via less invasive measures, such as enteral administration, they should be. Relative contraindications to peripheral IV insertion are site-specific and include infection, phlebitis, sclerosed veins, previous IV infiltration, arteriovenous fistulae, and burns or traumatic injury proximal to the intended insertion site. Finally, what are the potential complications of peripheral IV placement? Placement of peripheral IV is generally a safe procedure with little risk. Complications include phlebitis, extravasation of IV fluids, bruising, hematoma formation, pulmonary thromboembolism, and cellulitis. While generally safe, there is always potential for more severe complications. For example, extravasation of certain medications can be severe and cause significant tissue damage requiring debridement or surgical intervention. Fortunately, these are rare, and careful monitoring of a PIV site can help avoid these complications. It is clear to us now that a peripheral IV placement is indicated in Danny's case. You explain to Danny and his parents the process of what you'll be doing using the skills described in part one of this podcast series. You then leave the room to collect your supplies. Now that we have covered some indications, contraindications, and complications of peripheral IV placement, let's take inventory of what materials we'll need for this procedure and how to set them up. First, consider using a topical anesthetic. Common topical anesthetics may include Emla cream, which takes full effect in about 30 to 45 minutes, or Maxilene, which is a faster onset option, taking full effect in about 20 to 30 minutes. If time permits and the situation is not urgent, plan ahead and apply a topical anesthetic to the intended IV site. This has been clinically proven to reduce the pain felt by the child. Second, ensure you have proper personal protective equipment, which includes a pair of clean gloves and eye protection for yourself. Third, if a helper is available to assist you, this can make the process easier especially when first learning to place IVs. It is always better to have help. 
even those experienced at peripheral IV insertion benefit from an extra set of hands. Fourth, a tourniquet. Fifth, skin cleansing agents. Common options are chlorhexidine or alcohol swabs. Sixth, you will need a peripheral venous catheter of appropriate size. Typically, you will use an over-the-needle catheter with the gauge ranging from 24 in newborns to 18 in older children. Remember, the larger the gauge number, the smaller the diameter of the needle and catheter. Seventh, a saline flush and extension tubing. To prepare this, take a 10cc syringe filled with isotonic saline, sometimes prepackaged as a flush, and the extension tubing. Attach the extension tubing to the 10cc syringe and prime the line by pressing fluid through to the end of the extension tubing to ensure there is no air that can inadvertently be injected into the patient. Unless you have a helper, it is important to do this step now while you have both hands free. For sterility purposes, ensure that you keep the cap on the end until just before you are ready to connect your IV. Eighth, you will need tape or commercial adhesives, such as Tegaderm, to secure the catheter in place. It is helpful to have these ready ahead of time so there is no delay in securing the IV once it's in place. Ninth, dressings and covers. Armboards to stabilize limbs are particularly helpful in infants and young children, as are plastic covers to help prevent the IV from becoming dislodged. We have collected our materials and are ready to place the IV. We will assume you've applied the various teaching points from part one of this podcast series and have sufficiently prepared the patient and their caregiver for this procedure. Step one, identify your site. One of the most commonly reported challenges is having difficulty finding a vein. This is in part due to the fact that children have smaller and underdeveloped superficial vasculature than adults and often have a relatively higher proportion of adipose tissue on their extremities. A few techniques exist to support target vein identification. Consider wrapping the extremities in warm blankets for a short period of time to help the veins expand. Allow gravity to assist you by having the patient hold their hand or foot below the level of their heart. Flicking of the vein is discouraged in pediatric patients. If stimulation of the vein is still required, it can be done by stroking the vein gently along its length from a proximal to distal direction. Each potential IV site comes with its own considerations. The veins in the forearm are rarely used in younger children, as they may be difficult to see due to the increased adipose tissue mentioned previously. The antecubital fossa is an easier site to cannulate, but presents challenges for children who tend to be less compliant and portends catheter kinking and infiltration if an arm board is not applied to prevent flexion at the elbow. The dorsal hand veins are convenient, but often small. The great saphenous vein in the ankle is large and anatomically consistent, but if cannulated, limits the child's ability to ambulate. Scalp veins are available, but often require a portion of the patient's head to be shaved. Choosing a suitable site will depend on a number of factors, including patient characteristics, purpose or context of the IV placement, and intended duration of cannulization. Step two, once you have identified your site, apply a tourniquet proximal to the vein using a slip knot so that it can easily be removed later. A common mistake learners make is gripping the ends of the tourniquet, which results in a knot that is too loose and does not properly occlude the vein. Step three, clean the site. Step four, immobilize or isolate the chosen IV site and gently put the vein on stretch. This can be done by placing a soft roll of gauze under the elbow to elicit full extension if cannulating an antecubital fossa vein, or by holding the hand firmly with the wrist in flexion if using the dorsal hand veins. If the dorsal foot veins are to be cannulated, hold the foot firmly in plantar flexion. You can then stabilize the vein by placing your thumb and forefinger at either end and gently stretching the vein. Step five, take your needle with its overriding catheter in your dominant hand with your thumb and middle finger on either side and your index finger resting on top. Line it up with the trajectory of your chosen vein with the bevel or opening of the needle facing toward the ceiling. Now you have your pathway marked 
and are ready to place the IV. Step 6. Insert the needle at a 30 to 45 degree angle to the skin, advancing slowly until a flash of blood is seen in the hub of the catheter. Once this is appreciated, reduce your angle to about 5 degrees and advance the catheter and needle another few millimeters. This helps ensure the catheter tip is in the vein lumen. Step 7. Holding the needle apparatus firmly between your middle finger and thumb, advance the catheter over the needle and into the vein by using extension of your index finger. Step 8. Occlude the catheter under the skin by maintaining pressure over the IV entry site with your non-dominant hand. With the catheter tip occluded, remove the tourniquet. Step 9. When you are ready to connect the flush, that is when you remove the needle. Use the safety apparatus to conceal the needle tip and take note of where you place it, as you will need to dispose of this safely after the procedure is done. Step 10. With your non-dominant hand still occluding the catheter, take your 10cc syringe and extension tubing and attach it to the catheter. Step 11. Flush some of the isotonic saline to check for patency of the catheter. The ability to easily flush saline through the catheter with no swelling at the insertion site confirms IV placement. Step 12. IV Securement. You will learn that there are a number of commercially available dressings that are used for IV securement and you will become familiar with multiple throughout your time placing IVs. Let's revisit our case and our objectives. Danny's IV is secured and patent. His intravenous rehydration begins and his parents thank you for your efficiency. You have successfully placed a peripheral IV in a pediatric patient. In this session, we discussed common indications, contraindications, and complications of peripheral IV placement. We listed the materials necessary for peripheral IV insertion, and we listed the procedural steps of peripheral IV establishment. This concludes the second of our two-part series intended to introduce the listener to peripheral IV insertion in the pediatric patient. Thanks for listening, and good luck. Check out www.pedscases.com for more great podcasts, videos, interactive cases, questions, and more. Press subscribe on iTunes to get access to all of our podcasts. If you like what we do, please leave a review on the iTunes store, share with your friends and colleagues, or think about getting involved.